What's up guys, my name is Stu, and today we're going to be talking about which Elite TFOs are going to make your grind for the advanced consoles the easiest. The advanced science and engineering consoles are currently only available through certain Elite TFOs. Or rather, the crafting component that you need to create these advanced consoles. Those are what you get through these Elite level TFOs. Now, despite Star Trek Online having not introduced a new Elite level TFO in like three or four years, there are still quite a few of them in the game. So in this video, I'm going to be going over which console components come from which TFOs, which of those TFOs are the easiest that you'll want to focus on grinding, and just for the sake of it, we'll also compare the current exchange price for those consoles in case you want to just buy them off the exchange. Now, as for where these consoles come from, fortunately, the Star Trek Online wiki has all this information gathered right here conveniently on the Advanced Consoles page. I actually went over this page a little bit already in my last video that was going over the isomagnetic consoles, that's the, the new weapon power ones. If you want to visit this page yourself, I'll be sure to link it in the video description down below. First, I'll go over where to get the energy field gradient projector consoles. Those are the new shield drain consoles, which frankly, I thought were kind of the least impressive of the bunch. But if you're after these, good news, because these are probably going to be the easiest to get. And that's because the component for this console drops out of Cure Found, Hive Onslaught, Infected the Conduit, and Kittimer Vortex four of the easiest TFOs in this game. I mean, the fact that these drop from ISE alone, these are going to be very easy to get, especially if you're on the DPS chase or just like using ISE to test uh, your builds. Yeah, these are going to be very easy to get. Not to mention, they also drop from Defensive Starbase 1 and Swarm. Again, these are very easy TFOs. These two take longer than the four I mentioned above. But again, if you're just going about the grind and you're on a cooldown, these are worth doing. Now, ones I would definitely avoid, especially if you're just pugging these. Uh, Battle of Corfez, you definitely don't want to pug Corfez. Storming the Spire. Storming the Spire isn't difficult, it's just boring. So, I mean, you can do that one if you if you don't mind it. But yeah, that's one I would avoid doing just because it takes a while. And yeah, it's like I said, it's boring. Procyon 5 can be a bit of a pain in the butt with a pug team that doesn't know what it's doing. So I'd be careful on that one. Days of Doom, I would also avoid on a pug team just because it's not one of your conventional TFOs where you just go in and shoot everything. This one actually requires you to move back and forth between two different points to transport the warp cores to in front of the uh, the Doomsday Machine. And that can be a little confusing because sometimes it bugs and your just warp core will just disappear, which is very frustrating. But at the same time, on Elite, uh, you have to defend the Starbase. Like if you don't defend the Starbase, you will fail the TFO. So that's another thing to be concerned about because then you're going to also have to deal with pug fighting over who defends the starbase and who doesn't defend the starbase because that always becomes a thing whenever you have to split up a team so uh yeah i would just avoid this one people give gravity kills a lot of crap despite the fact that this tfo is actually really easy because seriously all you have to do is move the particles it's not that difficult stop attacking the zinkethi and just move the particles frankly days of doom is a far worse tfo than gravity kills but this is on Elite, so there are going to be certain conditions, and one of those is that you're going to have to make sure you keep the Jupiter alive for gravity kills, and that can be a bit of a pain in the butt, especially in that last phase where you're going up against uh, battle cruisers. And yeah, Zenkethi battle cruisers are very tanky, and they love using that torp spread. Elite gravity kills is certainly doable with a team that actually knows what it's doing, but definitely not something I would want to pug. Operation Repost and Battle of the Binary Stars are also ones I would recommend avoiding because they're very easy to fail because they require you to keep all the transports in Operation Repost alive and they require you to keep all the escape pods in Battle of the Binary Stars alive. Those are very easy to accidentally kill, especially if you're using something with a lot of AoE attacks or even if you get, just get something uh, too close like a, a warp core breach from an enemy warp core. Those can easily destroy the escape pods in Battle of the Binary. It makes those TFOs Huge pain in the butt, definitely would not pug those. Twin Tribulations and Core Assault, those are both competitive TFOs, and no one queues for the competitive TFOs because they're a huge pain in the butt because they require, they're sort of like pseudo PvP, so they require like a good amount of teamwork and for people to know what they're doing, which is why no one queues for them unless they're for a, um, one of the universal endeavors. Yeah, they're not super difficult for a team that actually knows what it's doing, but good luck finding enough people to actually know what they're doing to queue for those two TFOs. Zinkethi front isn't difficult on paper, the objectives are fairly simple, but fighting the Zinkethi can be rather difficult, especially on Elite. It wouldn't be that bad for a group running all high-end DPS builds, maybe you can carry one or two players that are on the lower end, but yeah, without a team with a high-end build, I would recommend against Zinkethi front. A number of ground TFOs also drop these field gradient consoles, that is the Brotherhood of the Sword, Defend Rio Station, Self-Destructed Tendencies, and uh, Transdimensional Tactics. 
Brotherhood of the Sword isn't a difficult TFO. I actually used to run this on Elite quite frequently just for general ground tours for uh, Elite Marks. And yeah, it's a fairly easy TFO as long as you know where all the uh, secondary objectives are, because normally those are optionals in the uh, normal and advanced queues. But on Elite, those are requirements. If you don't do those, you will fail the TFO. The big problem with Brotherhood of the Sword is that it's buggy. One of the objectives requires you to interact with an NPC and uh, guide him to another point on the map. To do this, you literally have to talk to the NPC and then they will follow you to that location. Problem is, sometimes this interaction breaks and instead of actually following you, the NPC will just go out and fight the Iconians that are spawning in. And that is a problem because if you can't get uh, that NPC to his destination, you fail the TFO. Assuming that's not an issue, uh, you're still going to need a team that actually knows what it's doing because this one is easy to fail if you're not paying attention. We've all had those pug runs where at least one member of the team is just being completely obtuse, who just doesn't know how to read chat, or is just deliberately trolling the team to purposely fail the TFO. We've all had those runs, it's... yeah, this one is one of those that's very easy to just screw up, purposely or not. Defend Rio Station, this one is easy. And funny enough, it's actually quicker than its normal and advanced counterparts. The first phase of Rio Station requires you to run around the station and uh, destroy several of the Elachi devices that are spawning all over the station. On normal and advanced, uh, this this phase is hard locked at I think it's like two minutes, three minutes, somewhere around there. So you're going to be running around uh, during that time until the timer runs out. On Elite, however, you only have to destroy six of those devices. If you don't destroy all six before the timer runs out, then yeah, you're going to fail the TFO. However, these things are so easy to destroy, this first phase goes by super quick. Transdimensional Tactics is another really easy TFO. In fact, this is the uh, one of the ground TFOs that the DPS League uses to uh, benchmark ground build DPS. It's kind of like the ground version of ISE. It's not going to involve a lot of traveling around going across a big map. You're basically just, you know, sitting in one, pit, uh, one spot, destroying a few things and then focusing on a main boss. It's a very easy TFO and a quick one. Self-Destructive Tendencies, this one's quite a bit longer and more involved, and it's actually, I don't think this one is actually in the random queues on uh, Normal and Advanced, so a lot of people don't even remember how to play this TFO, so yeah, this is another one of those. If you have a team that knows what it's doing, you can probably get this one, you know, pretty easily, but yeah, with pug runs, I would avoid it. So yeah, the fact that Cure, Hive, Infected, and Kittimer Space are all on the list for dropping these, yeah, these are going to be very easy to obtain. However, if you're really on the grind for these, you could also do Defense of Starbase 1, Swarm, uh, Brotherhood of the Sword. If you have a good team, Defend Rio Station, that one's an easy one to pug, and uh, Transdimensional Tactics. Those are ones I would focus on if you are after these consoles. Now let's see what these things cost on the exchange. So cheapest one is at 250k. They do scale up quite a bit, but I mean, even the first page, we're not even past half a million EC yet. Yeah, page two, we're getting up to 500k. But yeah, these are very cheap. Like, yeah, less than half a mil. I honestly, I was expecting these to be like, you know, in the 1.2 million range. This is cheap. You know, if you're after these consoles, I would just buy them on the exchange on all honestly. Since these are drain consoles, I would assume drain X would be the preferred mod for these consoles. And even then, like still two million for these gets a little higher over there. But yeah, even with uh, the preferred modifier for these, you know, to save you from re-engineering them, these are still pretty cheap consoles, which again is not surprising given how many easy TFOs there are that uh, will drop the component for crafting these. Now we'll look at the Exotic Particle Amplifier consoles. This one will be, will be much quicker because these only drop from four different TFOs. I don't understand the weird split because the Drain consoles drop from a ton of different TFOs, whereas the Exotic Particle uh, consoles only drop from four TFOs, which is a huge difference. The Engineering consoles are the same way. The Hangar Bay consoles only drop from these four, whereas the Weapon Power ones drop from all these. Yeah, I don't get it. Anyway, like their name suggests, the Exotic Particle Amplifier consoles will give you extra exotic damage for both your Bridge Officer abilities and your console abilities. Or, well, they say non-Bridge Officer abilities, but that's mostly going to be from your consoles. Bug Hunt is a very easy TFO, even on Elite. This is another one that the DPS League uses to benchmark uh, the DPS for ground builds. So yeah, it's just nothing but running and gunning. You know, you gotta wait for the dude to uh, set off the bomb to clear the way. But yeah, then it's just a bunch of killing a bunch of bugs. Undine Infiltration is a weird one. This is one of those examples of when Star Trek Online occasionally decides to get a little experimental with the gameplay and the TFOs. The first phase of this TFO actually involves very little and sometimes even no combat whatsoever. It involves you actually questioning several Bajorans, and then you'll go through their story, and then you'll have to verify their story with information placed around the room that they're inside of. There's like, I think it was like 12 to 15 of them, so yeah, 
it's going to be several of them. Split among five people, that's not going to be too bad, but it does require every member of the team to be, you know, actually questioning these, um, these Bajorans, which otherwise it'll take a while. It's also going to require the team to actually um, read, which uh, <laughs> a lot of people don't have the patience for that. And if you get it wrong too many times, you're going to fail as TFO. So, uh, yeah, this is one I would probably do with a team that actually knows what it's doing, not something I would do with pugs. Binary Circuit. This is another competitive TFO, so good luck getting enough people to queue for it, especially on Elite. Havo Dissension isn't that difficult of a TFO either, so all you gotta do is fight the Terrans on the ground, you gotta destroy the crystals, or no, you gotta destroy the devices and use the heal crystals on the Pavo stuff. Yeah, just follow the directions, it's not that difficult. The big thing with this TFO is that it splits up the map into three different routes. To get this TFO done as quickly as possible, you'll need to split up the team into three groups. Have two teams of two go into two different directions, and then have one guy go solo for one of the other lanes. Now, the guy going solo is definitely going to have to be a high-end DPSer who really knows what they're doing on ground combat. The teams of two, they should be a little bit better off because, you know, there's two of them. But if you don't have someone on the team that is capable of that level of DPS on their own, don't worry, you're not going to lose much if you just split into teams of two and three. That way you can do two of those lanes as quickly as possible. That'll probably be the team of three that'll finish first, and then they can move on to that last lane, and then the team of two can, can catch up with them. So yeah, Bug Hunt, very easy to do. Undine Infiltration does require a bit of know-how. I wouldn't do that with Pugs. Binary Circuit, you're never going to get enough people for Binary Circuit. That requires two teams of five because it's one of the competitives. And Pavo uh, Dissension, again, not as di not that difficult, a bit more difficult than Bug Hunt. So you're gonna, probably going to need a bit more experience than you would for Bug Hunt, but still not that difficult to grind. Now, as for the exchange price of these things, uh, again, cheaper than I expected. The uh, the cheapest one is a million, though this one seems to be a bit of an outlier. They quickly jump up to 1.5, 1.6, but these are EPG consoles, so you're going to want that EPG modifier. So once we get to the preferred modifier on these, they definitely jump up to uh, a price that I would expect more of. So 33 million if you get the preferred uh, modifier on these things, but just for the normal one, you know, just for anyone that you uh, just crafted that you haven't re-engineered yet, that's going to be uh, quite a bit cheaper. So if you don't mind re-engineering these consoles yourself, you might want to just buy them outright for EC. Of course, if you're crafting them, odds are you're going to have to re-engineer them anyway, so I don't know, really up to you and where you want to focus your effort. Because your odds of getting lucky and getting the EPG mod right off the bat are very slim given how many different modifiers are available on these, on these uh, advanced consoles. Oh, uh, I should probably bring this up too. Uh, remember the last video, how I went on that big rant about how there are too many modifiers on these advanced consoles and re-engineering them is a huge pain in the butt because you only have like a one in, I think it was like one in 24 chance of getting the modifier you want. Well, they added even more modifiers to these things. So now it's like one in 41 or 42, something like that. I didn't count them that closely, but yeah, it's way too many. Seriously, it's like they don't even want you to re-engineer these things just because they want to make it so impossible to get the one modifier you want. Anyway, moving on to where you can get the hangar bay consoles from, and where best to go. These are another one where they only come from four different TFOs. In this case, it's Borg Disconnected, Counterpoint, Gateway to Graythor, and Viscous Cycle. Borg Disconnected is kind of a pain in the butt because it requires the team to split up into uh, three different groups. However, unlike Pablo Dissension, which also splits into three different lanes, but, you know, it's kind of an option to, you know, go into all three lanes. You could easily just cover two of them and then get the third one on the way out. With Borg Disconnected, you have to cover all three. Splitting into three different groups, especially on a team of five, is going to be a pain in the butt because there's always going to be one guy that's left out to solo one lane. Not too difficult if you know what you're doing, but with pug runs, you never know what you're going to get, teammate wise. And frankly, this is just my personal opinion about the TFO, but it is boring and it is obnoxiously long due to the ridiculous time gates in each phase. So yeah, this is definitely one I would skip. However, if you uh, do enjoy this TFO or if you want to actually partake in this one on Elite, uh, make sure you uh, put hazard emitters on your bridge officers. Just one seat of hazard emitters is fine, but you want something that will remove damage over time effects from your ship. Because the objective of this TFO is to rescue several Borg ships from being fully assimilated so they can go join the cooperative. But the process to free those ships can be interrupted by taking damage, and that includes the damage over time effects that Borg plasma weapons can leave. So if you don't have hazard emitters, you just have to wait until that damage over time effect expires, which takes a little bit. And in that time, you could lose one or more of the ships. And if you lose too many, you're going to fail the TFO because this is elite. So yeah, that's another reason why I hate Borg Disconnected and why I would not recommend it for just pugging for grinding these components for these advanced consoles. 
Now, Counterpoint Elite, that one really isn't that bad of a TFO as long as you know what you're doing and you've got, you know, at least a moderate amount of DPS. I definitely wouldn't go into this with a lower end build. In fact, that's kind of true with most of these. It's going to be kind of hard for other players to carry you through this one because it does require you to kind of following the objectives, in which case uh, the first one is you got to close enough of the portals that um, several uh, Terran ships will spawn from. And then in the second phase, you have to get enough of the assault teams over to uh, from Deep Space Nine to Terok Nor. You also have to make sure Terok Nor survives the second phase. There's actually some bonus objectives in this one too. Those are optional. You'll actually get more marks for additional portals you close past the uh, the required five. And um, if you manage to disable Terok Nor, you'll get more marks for that too. Though disabling Terok Nor is not a requirement for the Elite uh, TFO version of uh, Counterpoint, which did surprise me. I would have thought disabling Counterpoint would have been a requirement, but it's not. I think it used to be, but it's not anymore. Wait, no, it wouldn't have because the old counterpoint, uh, the station would just repair itself after you disable it. So yeah, it, that was never uh, a requirement. So I guess they just d decided to not implement that even with the new mechanic or revolving around Tarak Nor. One thing I would recommend if you're going to do counterpoint is that uh, don't bring in a beam overload build because the science vessels from the Terran uh, critter group uh, those can use Feedback Pulse, and anyone who uses Beam Overload has probably been familiar with Feedback Pulse at some point or another, because it is it is a killer to just have all your damage thrown right back at you. That's... Ugh, I, hate, I hate Feedback Pulse so much. It is so overpowered for the NPCs. But yeah, it's less of a big deal for, like, Scatterfall or your Fire at Will, because you're less likely to actually one-shot yourself, so you'll have a chance to, you know, figure out what's going on, and then move away from the feedback from the uh, ship using Feedback Pulse. And as for Torpedo builds, then, you know, that's not going to be a problem for them at all, because there's no energy weapon damage. Also, dropping a heal on Deep Space Nine during the second phase is not a bad idea either, because, like I said, you do need to keep uh, Deep Space Nine alive, and several uh, Terran ships will spawn around Deep Space Nine as you go through the TFO. And even if it's just something like as simple, like um, the biomolecular, uh, what's it called? That big shield bubble from uh, the Undine reputation that unlocks as a trait. Biomolecular shield generator, that's what it's called. But yeah, even if it's just that, you know, dropping one of those on Deep Space Nine, not a bad idea. Gateway to Graythor. Honestly, it amazes me how many people still don't know how to play this TFO because it is shockingly simple. Seriously, in the first phase of this TFO, it always seems like there's at least one person. And every time I play this TFO lately, one person will always just go off in whatever direction they want and kill one of the groups of Iconians, or at least try to kill one of the groups of Iconians that have nothing to do with the objective. It annoys the crap out of me. All you have to do is split into two groups and fight off the groups attacking the shipyard and the starbase. All the other groups of Iconian ships, they have nothing to do with the objective. Killing them gives you no benefit to the TFO whatsoever. This includes that one group in the center of the two lanes. Just go around them. You don't need to fight them. Just go around and help out the other station if they still need it. Once you kill the two waves that are attacking the shipyard of the starbase, those extra groups around the map, those will despawn. So, like I said, there's no point in killing them because they're going to go away anyway. Now, for the second phase, the one with the gateways, only focus on the radiation portals. Those are the only ones you need to worry about. Just focus on closing those. Ignore the spawn portals. Because if you close the spawn portals, you will only be increasing the spawn rate of future spawn portals. So, yeah, leave those alone. So yeah, as long as you follow those rules, this is actually a very simple TFO, and it's not bad uh, if you get a pug group as long as the pug group knows these rules as well. Oh, also, hazard emitters and other hull heals would also be useful on this TFO as well for healing the transports, because you can only reclose those radiation gateways so quickly. Viscous Cycle really isn't that difficult either. All you gotta do is go where the minimap tells you to go, kill all the Undine, transport the assault teams to uh, the interact points so they can open up the shields around the planet killers and then kill the planet killers. The only pain here is that the transport can be interrupted by weapons fire, so if you're going to get hit, it's going to interrupt the beam cycle. So, you know, maybe try not to generate a lot of threat while you're doing that. But beyond that, yeah, this is a pretty easy TFO. So yeah, Borg Disconnected definitely wouldn't do with a pug group because it's long and it's annoying and I hate it and it's poorly designed. It's it's, it's a bad TFO, but even with a pre-made group, I still wouldn't want to do it because like I said, it's horrible. Maybe I hate Borg Disconnected more than Days of Doom. Wow. But yeah, Counterpoint, Graythor, Vicious Cycle, not difficult TFOs, you could definitely do these with somewhat mid-range builds, I definitely wouldn't do these with like super, you know, low-end free-to-play builds, but you can get, you, you don't have to break the bank for a build to get these done. 
I forgot to show up this part when I started this section. But yeah, they give bonus damage to Hangar Bay Torpedoes. They give weapon power to Hangar Bay Pets based on their rank. And that weapon power also stacks. So basically what the isomagnetic consoles does to your weapons power, it does these uh, Hangar Bay consoles does the same thing to the weapon power of your Hangar Pets. But worked a little differently. And they also threw in some uh, bonus torpedo damage. Now for the exchange price, these hangar bay consoles are going to be a bit more expensive, starting off at 7.5 million as of this recording. Ooh, and then they jump up to 10, so this could just be someone trying to kill some inventory. Now, much like with the isomagnetic consoles, uh, with these hangar bay consoles, you're really just going to want to focus on whatever damage type you're using for your modifier. So if you're using a phaser build, you'll want to use consoles with the phaser modifier. And uh, yeah, as you can see, 40 mil, 45 mil, then they'll jump up to 70 mil once they get into the ultra rare category. Yeesh, that's not cheap. Phaser is one of the more popular build types, though, so of course those are going to be in higher demand and thus more expensive. If you go to like Disruptor, the, you know, that price goes way down to like 24. Polaron even lower. Wow, actually 7.5 for a Polaron. No, I'm just going to. Thank you. So yeah, hangar bay consoles with the phaser modifier, those are going to be more expensive just due to the popularity of phaser builds. But moving on to the other damage types, you know, Polaron, Disruptor and such, those are going to be less expensive. That said, I definitely still wouldn't call them cheap. This is still going to be a lot of EC grinding. God, carriers just cannot catch a break, can they? Because not only do the uh, the advanced consoles for them, not only the engineering consoles, which makes no sense because science uh, carriers are the ones that need the help. So why make these engineering consoles? But they only gave four TFOs the ability to drop the component for these hangar bay consoles. Whereas the isomagnetic consoles have twice that. And then there's the shield drain consoles, which are just, yeah, these things are going to be littered all over the exchange. I really don't understand the logic there. Let's buff carriers, but in a super impractical way that's going to be unobtainable for most casual players. Anyway, let's move on to the isomag consoles. The isomagnetic plasma distribution manifold consoles are the weapon power consoles, which I already went over these in a video, so I'll just link that above somewhere up there. The performance of these consoles compared to the older Spire consoles has actually been quite surprising. These drop from Into the Hive and Minor Instabilities, Parallel over Pavo, Draenor Beach Assault, Draenor Gauntlet, Vault Ensnared, Herald Sphere, and Best Served Cold. Into the Hive is a very easy TFO, largely because you're just fighting the Borg, and Borg drones are actually very easy to fight as long as you have a weapon that they can't adapt to. Same goes with kit modules. So just make sure you have your Tommy Gun, or Cochrane Shotgun, or Lex Knives, or your TR-116, any of those, and you're fine. The big challenge with this map is not so much the enemies that you're fighting, but more so the map itself, because it creates a lot of environment hazards that you're going to have to avoid. During the first phase, you'll have to watch out for the glowing floor panels. The, you know, they're big square panels. They'll glow green, very easy to see, but that means they are charging up. And if you're standing on one of those when they fire off, you will die instantly. And if too many of you uh, die during this first phase, you will fail a TFO. So uh, yeah, watch out for those. Don't try to be a hero and try to jump it or beat the timer. Just either wait for the thing to fire off or go around. Yeah, in the next phase, there's these uh, ceiling mounted weapons. They'll lock onto you. You'll be able to see because there's be a big green crosshair that'll lock onto you. The uh, circle on it will get narrower and narrower. That's it locking onto you. What you want to do is just go over to either like one of the side rooms or just like head over to a wall and just wait for it to lock on you. When it does, you'll have a couple seconds before it fires. Just get out of the way and it'll fire and hit the ground. You want to guide these weapons out of the way to like near a wall or one of the side rooms just because uh, they lock on and then they sit there. So it's possible for one of your teammates to not be looking and then just wander into the AOE and then they'll take the hit, whereas you have already left it. It's not as big of a deal as the first room because it's not an instant kill like the floor panels, but yeah, it can be kind of annoying. So just kind of keep them out of the way if you can. Then there's a big hallway full of board. Just kill them all, then deactivate the force field at the terminal at the end. Then you'll be at the boss battle and the room in the boss battle. That will be uh, a combination of the first two mechanics. So you'll have glowing floor panels and the um, the ceiling mounted turrets that will lock onto you. So, you know, watch watch where you're walking when you're fighting the board queen. Minor instabilities is another one that's fairly easy, not nearly as easy as into the hive. But as, as long as you know what you're doing, this one's pretty easy to pass. One of the key mechanics of minor instabilities is keeping the miners alive. So in the first area, you've got a, uh, a camp full of Federation miners. You need to keep those alive. If the Romulans kill them, however, uh, you can actually revive them. Just use your normal revive ability like you would on a teammate on the fallen NPC, and that will revive the miner. Same goes with the Gorn miners in the next phase. Though if you are going to revive one of these NPCs, be quick about it because their bodies do despawn. And, you know, once they despawn, they're gone. There's no reviving them after that. 
the more of them you keep alive, the more marks you'll get at the end of the TFO. And obviously, if you let all of them die, then you're going to fail the TFO because this is elite. The final phase of minor instabilities involves uh, protecting one single Gorn engineer as he makes repairs around the other uh, mining site. Though there is an important note uh, for this part of the TFO, and this specifically goes out to engineer players like myself. Um, for the love of God, do not use cover shield. Neither players nor NPCs can walk through cover shield. So if you place that uh, cover shield in the wrong spot, you risk actually blocking the path for that Gorn engineer. And if you block his path, you basically break the TFO. Even if the cover shield despawns, if he's been struggling against it, this can still screw up his pathing and therefore the Gorn engineer just won't move at all. So yeah, for the love of God, don't use cover shield. It's not a good ability. I really wish Cryptic would just do away with cover shield entirely because all it does is cause problems. Peril over Pavo, I would recommend against pugging this one because this is definitely one, especially on Elite, that is definitely going to require a team that has at least a decent amount of DPS. So yeah, with pugs, you never know what you're going to get. So I would recommend against this. Same with Drenor Gauntlet. It's basically the same setup, but you have a wider variety of enemies. So because uh, you have an even greater uh, number of potential enemies, yeah, Drenor Gauntlet has a potential for being uh, an even worse debacle. Like, it's not bad if you're fighting the Gorn or the Orions, but if you end up with like the Zinkethi or uh, the Iconians, yeah, uh, Drenor Gauntlet can be uh, pretty crazy. Draenor Beach Assault is a little bit like the, the uh, competitive TFOs, wherein you need uh, two separate teams of five in order to complete it. So again, this is another one just on that basis. I wouldn't recommend pugging it. But even then, on its own, it's still a rather difficult TFO, especially with the part where the uh, the shuttles come in and start blowing up the shield generators. Those things are not easy to kill, even with a decent team. Vault and Snared. This is a very easy TFO. Uh, all you got to do is focus on the Tholian Web Spinners. They're very easy to spot because they're the ones with the uh, the yellow Tholian Web trail behind them, which is very easy to spot. And they'll also have the big uh, red target symbols pointing at them, up, you know, floating above. So, yeah, focus on those. Uh, keep destroying them and keep them pr um, from building progress to the big Tholian Web that's going to crush the vault. And yeah, you'll be fine. Then there's the boss fight where you got to destroy a Dreadnought and a small fleet. Uh, when doing that, make sure you focus on the named Dreadnought first. That is the one that needs to die. The others, they're just kind of add-ons. Uh, you can destroy them afterwards, but you want to focus on the named Dreadnought first. Also, be careful. They are inside of a nebula where shields will not work. That applies both ways. Their, uh, the Tholian shields won't work, but neither will yours. So when the Dreadnought does that one like big... Um, it's not really a spinal lance, but that with that big web attack, that's that, that'll basically be an instant kill unless you have a ton of hull because your shields will not be working. Herald Sphere is another one that really isn't that difficult. It's, you know, requires a bit more experience than, say, Vaulted Snared, but it doesn't take much to get through this TFO with a full team. The first phase is easy, is just kill all the Herald ships as they spawn in and then go through the gateway once the, uh, the phase is finished. The second phase is a bit more crucial. There will be several lanes laid out across the map in a big circle. Iconian ships will spawn at the end of these lanes and make their way to an Iconian gateway at the other side of the lane. What you want to do is destroy these Iconian ships before they can get through the gateways. If you let, I think it's 15 through, then you fail the TFO. Third phase is much like the first, just kill all the Iconians as they spawn in. Then the final boss fight is consists of a Dreadnought uh, and several portals that will spawn in more ships. The idea is to close the portals to keep more ships from spawning in, but honestly, the Dreadnought is so easy to kill, you don't even need to worry about the portals. Just all five members of the team should just go focus on that Dreadnought and kill it as quickly as you can, because then the TFO will be over. And the last one is Best Served Cold. This is another one I don't think is that difficult, but it is a little complex and can probably uh, throw players a bit who aren't uh, familiar with this TFO. There are three stations that you'll need to capture and then defend from uh, hacking enemies, because if enemies uh, manage to hack the station, they will take over the defense turrets that surround the stations. You want to maintain control of those. In the second phase, several prisoner transports will be uh, trying to escape from the surface of the planet. So for this one, you're going to want to split up even more. So you'll want to keep at least one person at each station uh, defending that, while one or two players goes down uh, closer to the planet and recaptures the escaping freighters. Then the final phase, there will be several dilithium haulers that will be filled with dilithium. When you destroy them, they will have a very large AOE destruction. It's much more powerful than your typical warp core breach. These are trying to make their way to the station to do a kamikaze run. You want to destroy them before they can do that. 
it's not difficult to do. These aren't tough freighters. You just don't want to be too close to them because their explosion can kill you if there are too many of them. So yeah, uh, particularly for people who aren't that experienced with elite level TFOs, Into the Hive and Vaulted Snare, very easy to do. For players who are a little bit more experienced, you could add uh, Minor Instabilities, Herald's Fear, and even Best Serve Cold, but Parallel over Pavo, uh, Draenor Beach Assault, and Draenor Gauntlet, I would definitely stay out of the public um, queues for those. Those are going to be a nightmare in pug runs. Now for the exchange price of these things, even though the isomagnetic consoles actually drop from more TFOs than uh, the hangar bay consoles, the price is much higher, which that is to be expected because these are in much higher demand because their performance has been pretty exemplary compared to all the other consoles, even against the, uh, the existing Spire consoles. These are actually outperforming those consoles by a good enough margin that a lot of people are really going for these, and that's why they are more expensive. You can see with the more preferential modifiers that price goes up even higher, though like with the hangar bay consoles that is largely going to be for the phaser modifier because phaser builds are much more preferred than a lot of other build types just because people really like phaser. If you go for like disruptor or plasma that price is going to come down a bit. But that said, definitely not cheap consoles still. Oh actually the components themselves aren't bound, those should be sellable on the exchange, let's see what those are going for. So the isomake console components, those are going for less than 4.5 million. You need five of these components to build one of the consoles, so in total that is going to be 21,255,000 EC for just uh, one console if you're going this route. Really not much of a savings. The hangar bay components, those are going for uh, a little bit, a couple of outliers, but mostly 1.5, 1.4. So you're looking at a difference of like 6 million versus the 7.5 million for the console itself. Again, not a huge savings. These are the components for the drain consoles, which are actually over a million, which is actually more than the console itself is selling for. So that's a ripoff. And these are for the exotic advanced consoles, a uh, couple outliers, but mostly like 285k. That's yeah, yeah 285k is pretty consistent for a good part of that. So you're looking at like 1.5, 1.7 for the console versus 1.425 for uh, the components themselves. So again, not a huge savings. So you're really not going to save all that much by buying the components themselves for the consoles. So I guess really the only reason to buy the components is to try your luck with the crafting system in getting actually uh, valuable modifiers. But like I said earlier, there are like 40 different modifiers now. So the odds of getting the one you want are still very slim. So is it even worth it at that point? Honestly, at this point, I'd rather just grind the TFOs because at least then I get marks too. And I could trade those marks for dilithium, and I'm going to need a lot of dilithium because I still have so many consoles to re-engineer, holy crap. Again, shout out to JB from Pirate Scum Gaming for helping me get a bunch of the uh, crafting components for these consoles, because that really helped. Now, more than a few of these TFOs are also ground TFOs, and I know ground TFOs aren't always the most popular in Star Trek Online, so I wanted to offer a few suggestions in order to kind of bolster your ground build if you're struggling in that area. Mud's time device is invaluable for a lot of ground builds. Not only is it good for survival because it uh, kind of offers a sort of reset if you die. So you activate it and if you die, you will basically spawn immediately back into the position where where you activated it. It's also useful for lowering the uh, recharge time of your other kit modules. So while this is activated, activating any other kit modules will lower the cooldown of other kit modules that are already on cooldown. You can pick this up in the Discovery Reputation. Another good one to pick up in the Discovery Reputation is the Gravity Containment Unit. This is just, it's a big cone that's a pull, it, you know, it deals physical damage. It is a surprisingly powerful ability, so you just activate it, big cone, boom, pulls everything towards you. Odds are most of the lower level enemies will just die instantly. Surprisingly powerful uh, kit module, and also in the Discovery Reputation, definitely worth picking up. The summer event is going on right now, which means it is a good time to pick up one of the most powerful kit modules in the game, probably, uh, Ball Lightning. What this does is spawn several well, balls of lightning around you and they will uh, deal electric damage to anything nearby. One of the best things to do with this thing is just run into the center of a group of enemies and just deploy this and everything will just die really crazily quick. It, this is a crazy powerful kit module. Honestly, the summer event is filled with other really nice ground gear as well. If you go into the uh, the store and find, yeah, here we go, ground equipment. Uh, there's a lot of really nice stuff in here. And Dorian Summer's not bad. Oh, the uh, the Ryzean kit. This thing is a fantastic ground kit, largely because one, it's one of the few kit, uh, kit frames that can be re-engineered. So you can just get one of these and then re-engineer it for as much uh, kit performance as you can fit on it, which that is a hugely valuable thing there. 
but it also has a really nice proc ability because if you activate a, um, a any of the summer kit modules, you have a 20% chance to trigger any of the other summer kit modules, whether you have them equipped or not. This is a potential for a very powerful kit frame, especially if you're using at least even just a few of these summer kit modules. So like ball lightning is really nice. Uh, Sandstorm generator and the hurricane turret. These are really nice for engineers. These two aren't bad either, but they're not quite as good. Sonic Agitation Field. This isn't bad for um, science characters. Sonic Disruption's also pretty okay. Dark Matter Cloud isn't as nice as I would like it to be, but the others are pretty decent. Graviton Spike is pretty nice. Uh, so is Corrosive Grenade and Magnetic Deployment. Uh, the Floor is Lava. This is also pretty nice, but it has a really long cooldown, so that can be kind of frustrating. Honestly, I wouldn't even bother with going with um, the Floor is Lava just because you actually have a chance to get it with the Ryzean uh, kit frame, as well as most of the others on here. But yeah, it's just, it, I'm sorry, you're gonna get it almost as much with just the kit frame itself than you would with the actual kit for, uh, kit module. But yeah, the summer event, definitely a good place uh, for sprucing up your ground build if you're looking to do that. Uh, if you've got some EC to blow, Baul Obelisk Network is always a nice one to have just because not only is it very powerful, you know, on its own, but the more players that have it, the more powerful this kit module gets because not only does it network to the ones created by your kit frame, but it networks to all of them, no matter who spawns them. So this is potentially a very powerful kit module. Uh, let's look at some of the event stuff. Uh... The, the exosuit is amusing. I It's only going to be v valuable in certain TFOs, though. I wouldn't rely too heavily on that, but it is it's not a bad uh, kit module either. Uh, the Torchbearer ground set, that's not bad. Uh, Vidra probes, that's pretty good. Oh, the Kumarke visionary set. This thing is very powerful because you get that. Um, I forget that lightning ability. I forget what it's called. That is very powerful. So if you manage to get uh, this set, definitely uh, worth using. The Imperial armor set isn't bad either. Uh, more stuff from the reputations, Burnham CQC armor, very powerful for, uh, for a personal armor because it gives really nice buffs to your crit chance and severity. This also comes from the Discovery reputation, very nice to have. There's also the Nakul shield. This is an episode reward from, what's the episode called? Temporal Front, that's it. But yeah, uh, if this thing takes too much damage, it creates sort of like a, um, sort of like a ghost version of you. It's like a temporal something or a temporal slip, that's what it's called. But yeah, it creates like a little copy of you and it, it'll make you immune to damage until the uh, the copy disappears. And the nice thing about it is that the NPCs really aren't programmed to uh, target the little copy version. So as long as it's up, you're you're immune to damage. So it, it won't stay up forever. Obviously, that would be super broken. But yeah, it's it's a nice extra layer of protection for you. I often use the two piece for this set because that grants even more crit chance and severity. There's also the Pavo Healing Crystal. This comes from the episode Illusion of Communication. Uh, it functions just like a hypo spray, but one, it's not consumable, so you'll always have it on you. And it also applies to the entire team, not just you. So it's not only a good heal ability for yourself, but it's also a nice support ability for the rest of the team. Oh, you can also get the Rainbow Tribble from the Summer Event. This gives crit chance, but this is this is really nice, especially when more people are using it, because the more people you use it, the stronger the buff is. So yeah, crit chance, always good to have. So yeah, that is where each of the components for the advanced consoles come from and which TFOs I would recommend for grinding if you're trying to get these quick. I also went off on a bit of a tangent to help you with your ground build. I hope you found that helpful. So yeah, let me know if you found this useful down in the comments down below. And while you're down there, be sure to hit like and subscribe and hit that bell for notifications. If you'd like to further support the channel, you can hit the join button or the super thanks button or find the link to the merch store in the video's description. If you're ever shopping on the Epic Game Store, be sure to use my creator code STU1701. Doesn't cost you anything extra, but it does help out the channel. So I really do appreciate it. Either way, thank you so much for watching. My name's Stu and I will see you guys next time.